Good afternoon to all the smooth operators that are going to watch this video. Today I got an interesting topic. We are going to talk about the differences between secured party, secured party creditor, secured creditor, the redemption movement, what works, what doesn't work, how many people are out there uh, wondering about this topic, probably most of you. So I'm going to go ahead and try to, for once and for all, break it down on what does work and what doesn't work. This is my opinion, okay? This is not written in stone, but I want to tackle it because competency allows you to compete, okay? Anybody that has any questions, you could go ahead and hit the link in the subscription of this YouTube video and you can contact me directly on Messenger, okay? And if you would like to know more about any of these topics, okay, I do have a secured party, secured creditor, secured whatever you want to call it type of course that allow you to be able to employ not legal theories, but legal precedents. And it's not legal advice. It's just a conversation. But it is a course. Do not take this as legal advice. Go find yourself a competent attorney. Now let me go ahead and break it down, okay? Everybody uh, that's doing these redemption movement type of processes, okay, they find that they have a high failure rate in the courtroom. The reason why they have a high failure rate in a courtroom is because they are mixing jurisdictions. Okay, everybody says that the government is a corporation. That is true. You can find that out in Title 28, Section 3002. 15A of the United States Code. It specifically says that it's a corporation. So when you do your legal redemption processes and you are applying UCC ones and trying to say, well, you know what, judge, I'll put a lien on you or whatever. You, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to negotiate the deal based on liabilities. Hey, you're saying I'm liable for this. Traffic ticket, for example, judge. Okay, so this is an example. A judge says you're liable for a traffic ticket. And then you come in with the UCC one saying, no, wait, I control the straw man. Well, guess what? You're done. In that courtroom, they can't even recognize it. The reason why they can't recognize it is because you're not even a claimant. Now, if you're trying to raise claims based on your infraction inside of that courtroom, you're fucked up. Because whatever claim you raise does not mean that you did not conduct the illegal activity or purported illegal activity. Abdicating from the statutes, I'm going to tell you right now, abdicating from the operation of the statutes puts you in an invisible zone, unrecognizable by the court operator judge who is there to apply the statutes. That's like... Trying to go in front of a blind man and showing him that you got two fingers up and he can't see your two fingers. It's not in his purview. So what are we talking about? Secured party what? You're there for a traffic ticket. The only thing that judges respect is what they can be held liable for. That means it must be a clear and blatant abuse of their discretion and judgment. And for that, there are remedies statutorily. You are not going to get a remedy unless you use what they can see those statutes are there for you to express your injury in a quantifiable operational by law format. Anybody has a problem with that assessment? 
show me, show me that you have used your legal theory to beat them. You can't. If you argue, here's another example. How about this? If you argue federal statute in a state court, they do not have to acknowledge unless you make a nexus between between the two law systems and it has to be such a nexus that it would cause an inherent liability on the judge. Period. And the prosecutor. If you cannot do that, you're not going and using a Title 42, Section 1983, or even the federal constitution because those judges have a state constitution. Now, in a state constitution, there are equivalent articles within that state constitution that mirror the federal constitution. And that would be an appropriate nexus. He who does not educate himself in the enemy's tongue is going to be talking to like a dog from an enemy. Period. Now let's do a cursory search on Google to see if Secure Party Creditor exists outside of the realm of legal theory. So I put it in to Google. I got it on screen. And this is what comes up. What does it mean to be a Secure Party Creditor? This is the first link. Secure Party Creditor over the trade name Strawman. Trade name is not the same as trademark. Trade name is your business's name in which you can file that over at the Secretary of State's office, but that's just the name. That's it. That's it. A trademark is something totally different. And it has a totally different level of recognition inside of a courtroom. You have a trade name and you say, this is my trade name or this is my DBA. They're going to say, okay, that's how you do business. Oh, okay, that's the name of your company. Yeah, what's your liability? That's what they're going to ask you. Someone infringes by using your trade mark. That's a security interest. It's different than a trade name. Totally different. If you don't believe me, look it up right now. A secure party is one who holds an interest in the company's assets. They would record this interest in the public records by filing a UCC-1 financing statement. Okay, so you file a UCC-1 filing statement. Well, what's a UCC-1? It's a notice of lien, pretty much. But where is the lien? Oh, the lien is on these assets that I put inside of the description box of the UCC-1. Any one of you that have ever seen a UCC-1, you'll know what I'm talking about. The fact of the matter is, it th is this, <laughs> is this. Your UCC-1 is not a security agreement. It is not... A lien. It is a notice thereof. In order for you to be able to have some legally cognizable effect on your security interests, you must be suing because somebody is jacking with your security interests. And do you know what that's called? That's called theft. That's called trespass. That's called infringement. That's called, and you pick up a litany of things that are synonymous to this guy stole my shit. But your UCC-1 financing statement is just the statement of what you're interested in. You must have a form of security agreement. Now, that security agreement is only in effect to those members who are signatory to the agreement. Think about it. You got a guy who you don't got a contract with. You didn't give him no money. 
And you're trying to hold him liable for a contract that you did with somebody else within your company. You're not going to have a legal effect. So why in the hell are people saying, hey, man, security agreement. Yeah, UCC one. Yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever. You don't know what a UCC one is. You got a judgment, let's say, from suing somebody. You can take that UCC one along with that judgment and that judgment will act as a binding upon the parties, which makes it a security agreement in effect. And you can compel the specific performance listed on that judgment. That you can do, but only to the party who is liable. So a UCC one can work with the judgment. You can secure debtor's assets if he's your debtor. But what you can't do is just get a judgment against John and try to enforce it against Bill. Very well. So when we look at this first link, okay, I'll open it up to see if I could. Oh, it's just a picture. So let's let's just look at it for what it is, according to this. Well, what's the difference between secure party credit and a private citizen? Okay. And in American national related terms, they basically mean the same thing, but are slightly different. And that would be a falsity. That would be a falsity. See, I don't even want to read this because it'd be a falsity, but I got to read it because I put it up on screen. Okay. So a private citizen is someone who is private and not governed by any de facto corporation like the U.S. corporation or its subsidiaries like the state of California, the state of Texas, etc. American National is a private citizen of anywhere in America, North or South America, anywhere whatsoever. Can be an Indian territory. Okay. State citizen is an American national who is not an Indian, not from Canada, not from Mexico, or not from South America, or not, I mean, or Caribbean. A state citizen is one who is domiciled in the Republic common law of New York or Florida or California. Non-resident alien with respect to the United States corporations means you are residing in the Republic. And in the view of the United States corporation, you are not residing in their jurisdiction. So they have no territorial jurisdiction by being an alien foreigner. They also do not have a in persona jurisdiction. And you got the SPC, which is the secure party creditor. And then that's someone who is a citizen and has a birth certificate or certificate of citizenship in, in born, excuse me, if born abroad or permanent resident who has a green card and social security number who has voided and canceled the contracts creating the U.S. citizen resident and replaced them with a private citizen status who is, I mean, who has taken control of their legal name trust and can operate freely to discharge debts or court actions at will. Okay, listen, man. Look. Jesus. Let me just unpack that. All of those UFO statuses that you just read, I'm just going to shut it down with this. Let's say you come from Mexico. You cross the border. You commit an infraction against the law. The police will arrest you. Period. Okay, when you go into court, let's say no habla inglés, you get a translator, but you know this entire process. You will still be held into account with the law. What are you going to say? Give me arguments. What are you going to say? What are you going to say? Dump it. Are you going to say, hey, uh, well, you know, I'm from, I'm a, I mean, excuse me, I'm from a foreign land. You don't have any jurisdiction over me. Fuck you. Are you crazy? Military power, dude. The United States is an operating machine. Corporation. Full of combat. They will put a gun to you real quick and stuff your ass in a can. What legal remedies do you have? Does because you're not born here mean that you can defy the laws of here? Just think about that. 
Think about it. Here's the bottom line. The bottom line is, is that your ass is grass. Unless you have a wrongdoing from the state that is actionable in which, for the prosecution thereof, the state could be held liable by its agents violating their own rules of when they can be violated, you are not negotiating in that corporation anything cognizable. And I am not going to say that again because that shit was mouthful. Okay? So, when is someone a secured party creditor? Well, here's the deal. You're not a secured party creditor. There is no such thing as a secured party creditor. You can look up right into Wikipedia and look up the redemption movement. And it'll start talking about the entire history, okay? And it'll talk about, I mean, everything on that fringe movement, now, why do I call it a fringe movement? Because it is. If you see that people are making instruments, debt, bonds, and they're trying to discharge debt, okay, that's a federal offense. Title 18, Section 513 and 514. You're done. You could go to jail for like 20 years. So, why do people use this whole secure party creditor process as a marketing tool. Well, let me tell you why. Because you might have had a bunch of people who my cigarette keeps going out. So it's like I'm freaking you know, having to relight it. So here's the deal. The secure party creditor process, okay, came from people who pretty much, you know, they, they were getting tired of having their rights trampled on. That's what it was. You know, free land, free this, free that. Government, stay away. We need to find a liability. And, you know, I mean, sounds nice. Sounds nice. Okay, I'm going to secure my assets and things like that. Put it in a trust. Yeah, that shields. It shields. Yeah, from suit. Nobody's going to be able to monetize your assets. Okay, you can do that. You can take all your assets and put it into an, uh, a trust or an irrevocable trust. That's fine. Are you going? Are you going to be uh, held liable for anything? Well, yeah, you will be. You'll be held liable for stuff. What will you be held liable for? Whatever the debt is. But will your assets be converted? No, they will not be converted. Why will your assets not be converted? Well, because they got to wait for you to pay the debt. And most people can't be jailed just for owing most debts. Okay? If you owe somebody a million dollars from a civil suit, the judgment can be awarded. And the party who got the judgment awarded runs the risk, if you're broke, to never ever, ever be able to claim, I mean, collect that judgment, that debt. Okay, well, if that's the case, then what's the point of going to court? I don't fucking know. You tell me. I mean, why are you suing broke people? How about that? Well, so the issue, okay, with having a debt on somebody is for another day. What I'm trying to get across is you will not be able to discharge debts correctly by using the basic secure party creditor package method or any of these legal theories that most people are talking about unless you touch on what is legally recognizable by law. Is a trademark legally recognizable by law? Yes, it is. Trade name? Yes, it is. 
I told you they have two different effects. If you want to know more about the trademark, go ahead and look at on this channel my video I did last week on trademarks. Common law trademarks and registered trademarks. Can a judge be liable for that asset? If you put that in a trust and the trust sues, not you, the trust sues over the use of that judge using it in a courtroom. The answer is yes, depending on how you set up your trust. Look, the trust suing can have a direct effect on your situation. Even though they are two different, let me say this again, two different actions. I am not going to unpack that right here, right now. But yes, it can be done. And can it have the exact effect that you were looking for with the secure party creditor process? The answer is more than the effect of your secure party creditor process. And anybody that wants to challenge me, I'm here for the challenge. I can prove it with law. I can prove it with results. That's why if you got a question, go ahead and hit that messenger link inside of the subscription or go to my Facebook. Get involved. This is 2021. Okay. Not getting political, but we had a very booming economy just now and things are about to get silly. That's my opinion. Things are about to get silly. Either way, both of those guys, just to keep it apolitical, are going to do what they did and what they're going to do. What I am saying to you today is that there is a way to have that secure party creditor effect that you think you know come into fruition, but it's not the way that you're doing it. <sighs> Look. You know what? I'm not even going to get into that portion. Okay? Just read. I want you to read the Redemption Movement article inside of Wikipedia. Those are the mistakes you cannot make. It's hard to get that very real effect that we're speaking of. You must get educated in law. If not, you are not going to have the effect that you're looking for. And most of these topics that are exploited in the secure party creditor process or redemption movement are actual processes that exist in the world. The problem is, is the asshole that's telling you how to do them is not qualified to tell you how to do them. They don't really, I mean, they don't really know how to do asset management for a trust. They talk a lot, a lot. They don't know. I haven't met one. It's always close, but no cigar. Okay. So let's look up what a secured creditor is. A secured creditor is a creditor with the benefit of a security interest over some or all of the assets of the debtor. Of the debtor. In the event of the bankruptcy of the debtor, the secured creditor can enforce a security interest, I mean security against the assets of the debtor and avoid competing for a distribution on liquidation with the unsecured creditors. 
Why is it that a secured creditor can have the ability to avoid competing for a distribution on liquidation with unsecured creditors? Well, the reason why is because the motherfucker has a contract or a bond against those assets. And where one has a contract and a bond, he can enforce it because the shit's there. It's on paper. Verifiable. And you must meet the requisites of local or state or federal requirements for that security interest to be verified. You can put a contract on the UCC1 and that could be an asset. How do you think private equity firms do things? Get all this funding. All right. So bottom line, again, is, is that secured party creditors are really trying to put themselves in a position of secured creditor. Hmm. Secured creditor. Well, what type of asset, if you're trying to be the theoretical secure party creditor, could actually put you as a secured creditor with a non-signatory party to an agreement? Only an asset that is legislated into law with effect that says that there is a waiver of immunity or sovereign immunity as a result of the engagement minimum contacts established with that asset. Let me give you an example. Fucking money. Fucking money. If I pay your ass $5 to come and take care of my lawn. And you do not come and take care of my lawn. And I take pictures and evidence that you did not complete the task. I can sue you. Statutorily. But Raymond, that's not an agreement. What do you mean it's not an agreement? It is the social compact. I just said at the beginning of this conversation. That if you do not have a legal remedy in statute that is enforceable by a court, you will not be able to have the judge hear your case. They can't see the matter. It's immaterial. What's another form of money? Or the effect of money that could bind a non-signatory? A trademark. Not a trade name, a trademark. If it's just a trade name and the allegations are false, then you can sue for defamation or abuse the legal process or something. We need the effect to be like money. If this game is a corporation and the corporate rules have been written in statutory provisions, then you must be a better negotiator. And if you don't have a situation with money or has the effect of money, then you're not doing business properly. No judge, no prosecutor, no lawyer has immunity when it comes to touching money, unless it's an imminent domain type of action or asset forfeiture action. The problem is, is that when you're using state title paper, the state has the ability to get its property back. What they don't have is full control over trademarks. And they say copyrights, they don't have full control over trademarks. So in your processes, take out the fucking name of trade name, straw man, make it your trademark, and let your trustee, trusts, trustees actuate the situation. Come back to me when you're done and just leave a comment and tell me how that went for you. If you know how to execute on it. That is a huge secret I just gave to you guys. You're looking at this glass of secured creditor. Not as half empty and not as half full. 
Just imagine that the secure party creditor glass, right, is really a secured creditor glass. But the reason why you're seeing it as a secure party creditor is because your perspective is wrong. Your perspective is wrong. There were people who came before you, who led you down a path, who meant probably well, some might have not. It got more advanced because people started to wake up. They started to look at the law. And then they started to advance the processes. And some of them can work from time to time. But a lot of them fail. The reason why is a lack of actionable knowledge. You must stop looking at this glass of water that's half full, which sits on a glass table from the bottom of that glass table, trying to measure the contents within. Step out of under that table and look at it as it sits on the table and whether you're half full or half empty, both are equally true. Your perspective is wrong. It's not a secured party creditor. Now I can go longer and I can break it down and go into processes, but that's not what I'm here for. All I did today was define why it's wrong to claim secure party creditor. And it's stupid, stupid. Oh, did I hurt someone's feelings? Stupid. Fuck that, challenge me. Stupid. Give me the legal precedence. And don't give me some statute around and about the situation. I need a statute that actually says, look, motherfucker, you touch my shit, you will be liable. You can't do that. You can't do it. I got a bunch. I dare you. And it better be, it better be consistent with your legal theory. Because mine's is not a legal theory. You can Google the results. The problem is. Is the way that I concoct it. And the verbiage and usage that I use. Creates a scenario. When you do the contract building. And the venues and choices of laws. And, and things like that. When you take care of all of the legal. Facts. With the way that I do it. You will be able to bind them. They will not be shielded. Let me give you an example. You know what? Let me not give you that example. I'm going to shut this, <laughs> shut this uh, conversation down. And uh, remember what I said, okay? There is a course for this. There is a course. I'm offering it. There's a fucking course. Okay? It's six months. I'm not doing any more than six months because you should be able to get it in six months. One hour a day, five days a week. Call for details. All right? Just look aside. The link in the description. Hit me up on Messenger. If you don't use Messenger, I don't care. Okay? It's easy to just download Messenger. If not, leave a freaking something in the description box here and we will talk. For a limited time only, I'm taking 25% off, okay, of the donation. So you can hit me up and get your six months worth of training. Okay? Six months worth of training, five days a week, one hour a day. If you do not have the time, don't call me. If you do not have the ability to take care of this, think about it first because you're going to get real knowledge. If not, don't call me. I am not working for you for free. That is what I'm not doing. Okay, I'm not doing it. You can learn this and you could change your life or you could sit back and from time to time read a post and try to figure out this matrix of a spider web that goes down a spiral nest to oblivion 
and do circles around yourself in an abyss. But I'm here to help. Okay? And again, it's not legal advice. You're just going to be shown what already exists. The same way how I show it on a cursory search. That ain't legal advice. That's free speech. You will be put into a trust so that these are minute meetings on the daily. And you will get on the job training of how to do this process. It is not free. It is hard. And you know what? I wasn't even going to do one this year. But I've been having some extraordinary comments. And I love it. Okay? I'm the guy that likes to meet the task. So I just, I get motivated. I become competitive. There's a saying. It's better to be a warrior in a garden than be a gardener in a war. So come over here. Get this warrior training. Protect yourselves. Protect your families. God bless. And go ahead and fill up that comment section. Have a great day.